Okay, so it is um, 10 o'clock, and I like to start on time. We have, we had about nine people registered, and I guess five of us have, are on the call now. So we'll get started, and as people join, um, I'll just acknowledge that they've joined us. So I thought what we could do is start out introducing ourselves, and I'll start with me. So I'm Carlin Raffi, um, an extension specialist here at Virginia Tech. And I have been working with the colon cancer free zone actually for a number of years before I came to tech and was an, an extension specialist four years ago. So um, I think it's a great program and I always wanted to bring it to, um, to extension. And so that's what I'm doing. And I think I met some of you guys at the NEAFCS conference when I introduced this program. And I'm really happy to be able to bring this to you guys now. So I thought um, real quick, if we could just um, introduce ourselves, say where, where you're from and what your position is, and then we'll get started with the program. So let me, I'll call out people. That'll probably make it easier. Maybe I could start with Darcy. Darcy, could you introduce yourself? Good morning. My name is Darcy Gallier. I'm from Mead, Kansas, and I'm actually joining this webinar. We are having or hosting a health fair next month and I wanted to see if I wanted to incorporate this into our health care. Rudy, how about you? Yes. Good morning everyone. My name is Rudy. Can you all hear me? Um, sometimes if you don't have both your phone and your computer uh, audio, do you? Yeah. Yeah. You didn't call in and also use the computer? No, I'm only using computer right now. Okay, well, just introduce yourself and then you can mute yourself and it'll probably get rid of that. Okay, great. Well, good morning, everyone. My name is Ruthie Patel and I work with the University of Maryland Extension. I'm very interested in this program because I attended one of your sessions during last annual conference. And uh, I'm actually very excited to learn the prospect of um, introducing this to some of my adult clientele or even website uh, actually. So I'm glad to be here. Thank you. Wonderful. Th thank you, Judy. Jacqueline, I see you've joined us. Jacqueline, could you introduce yourself? Yes, I'm Jackie Ogden. Can you hear me? I'm Jacqueline Ogden, Jackie Ogden, and I'm in Chatham County in Savannah, Georgia. And I work with uh, UGA Cooperative Extension and of course with Dr. Allie Berg at UGA. And um, have worked with our cancer prevention cooking school for uh, really since the beginning of that program. And most recently, our local hospital and extension here in our county, we have been working on colon cancer education. So I was very intrigued by this. And Allie also sent out the request as well as you. And so I was delighted to be involved um, on the call today. Wonderful, great to have you, Jacqueline. Lo I love working with Allie. I just got something pop up on my computer that says my internet is unstable. I don't know why I'm here at the university, but in case we disappear, I may have to reopen the session. So just in case something happens with the internet, I will do everything I can to reopen it and we'll continue, okay? Uh, Bill, could you introduce yourself real quick? With Virginia Cooperative Extension and uh, Southwest Virginia. Actually, I serve as the uh, district forestry and natural resources extension agent. Great. So, um, yeah. So that's a little bit different. Bill has a little bit different background than than some of us probably. So I'm I, welcome, Bill. I'm glad you're on the call. Um, and I think I saw Amy Hawkins join us. Amy, are you on? Hmm. And please remember to unmute yourself. Judy, Jacqueline, Darcy, William. Okay, so I saw her join. Let me see. Um, Amy, are you on the call? Hi, good morning. Can you guys hear me? Now I can, yeah. Okay, this is Amy Hawkins. I'm from the Mecklenburg Extension Office, the FCS agent. Great, wonderful. Okay, so let's get started. Um, so what I'd like to do, hopefully all, you all can see my slides here. What I'd like to do today is first just to describe how to conduct the colorectal cancer-free zone, which I think is what you are most interested in. 
I also want to explain how we would like to evaluate the programs. We have various evaluation tools. I think all of us agree we want to evaluate actually the outcomes, but I'd also like to gather a little bit of process data on how you all implement the program. So I'll talk about that in a little while. And then I'll let you know how you can access the color of the free zone materials on our Canvas site. So um, basically, the colorectal cancer free zone program at its most basic level, it's a work site wellness program that um, is an information campaign, really, first of all. So it is a communication campaign to increase people's awareness of colorectal cancer, um, how you prevent it and how you get screened for it. And we have several mechanisms within the colorectal cancer free zone to do this. So it's not just conducting two information sessions. It's actually a campaign that uses um, various modes of transmitting these messages over a period of time, uh, generally between two to four weeks, um, so that people hear the messages over and over again. In addition, you do conduct two information sessions. And we will talk about uh, what what's goes into those information sessions in just a minute. So that's basically what it is. There are some key strategies that are incorporated in how we conduct the colorectal cancer free zone that have been shown to move people from thinking about doing something to actually doing something in the context of a worksite program. So the first key component or key strategy of the colorectal cancer free zone is that you should definitely get administration buy-in. So it's really important as you think about conducting this program in a work site that you pay attention to the um, management within the work site you're planning on implementing it and that you encourage uh, and hopefully get their buy-in to the program. They have to believe in the program and think that it's a good thing for their employees. And I'll show you we have ways to help them actually show that support. The second thing is this idea that we want to repeat certain key messages to the employees through multiple avenues and on multiple occasions. I think we all know that um, when we hear something once, uh, it's easy to ignore. If you hear it a second time, you begin to pay attention. But it takes three or four times hearing something to really be convinced that you ought to think about acting upon it. And so that's the idea of this program. For it to really be effective, we need to, in this uh, period of the colorectal cancer free zone campaign, get those messages out uh, to employees on multiple occasions. The third thing that we've incorporated in the program is your support. So. Um, I know that you, you guys probably are aware that if your friends are doing something, your family's doing something, or people, your colleagues are doing something, you're more likely to think about doing it yourself. This uh, peer support, also sometimes we hear things better from our colleagues than we do from some, some people from the outside. So we have a couple of mechanisms for pulling in peers and having peer support in this program. One is if you can uh, get a champion either from management or from the employees who has been impacted by colorectal cancer, who can be the person who's kind of encouraging people to participate in the campaign, that would be great. And we also have a system for having uh, employees give their testimonials about their experience with colorectal cancer screening. So I'll talk about that in a minute. And then a call to action. So it's been shown that in programs like this, uh, it, it's not enough just to transmit information, you actually have to solicit that people take some kind of an action and it should be something that it's easy for them to do, but that first step or that first action they take can, can lead them into taking further action as well. So we have a simple call to action in the colorectal cancer free zone program of having people actually sign a pledge, and I'll talk about the pledge in a minute. And then incentives is the final thing. So although incentives are not indispensable for the program, they can help get employees to actually participate in your activities. Um, and this, you know, the, the program itself does not have funding to provide those incentives, but uh, getting incentives that can be given by the employer, particularly if they're really bought into this program, having them actually give some kind of incentive that is relevant to their employees can be a real um, stimulus to get participation, which is what you want. And then even small things. So we've done, we've given some small incentives like the people come to the colorectal cancer free zone um, 
sessions. They get a little pin, a, one of the little stars, the colorectal cancer stars, which is very inexpensive, and but it gives them something that they can put on their lapel or on their shirt to show that they've attended, or a little wristband. So it can be as simple as that, but it can be more complicated as well, and we'll or, and we'll talk about that as well. So what about the program component? So we, I talked about the two things this program is, and the first is a campaign. And so with the program, we have developed some communication resources for you to use and think about when you're doing your program. And so I've show, I show you here some examples of those. The first is actually a proclamation, a proclamation statement that the administration can actually sign and then post or send out as an email that they have this proclamation that this certain two to four weeks is going to be a colorectal cancer free zone program and they're proclaiming that they are on board with this and they think it's important that their employees think about getting screened and, and having healthy lifestyles. So that is one visible way that you can have management actually uh, show their support for the program and we have a proclamation, a kind of a draft proclamation for you to use for that purpose. We have multiple different campaign posters that we have designed that you are free to use. Um, that's we've signed the pledge kind of a thing. Um, this, uh, these posters um, can be uh, posted. They can also be sent out as email messages. Uh, but in the work site, just to make people aware that something's happening around colorectal cancer and they should be aware of it, and how can they be engaged? So this poster just announces, hey, this program is coming. Here's how you can be involved and look for these things to be happening within the work site. Um, we also have posters and or flyers that are specific to the events that are going to be occurring. So we have a flyer that announces the times and dates for the two information sessions you can use and put in your, the information from your own program. Um, we also have flyers that tell people how they can submit testimonials. We have flyers talk about how people sign the pledge, how, where they find the pledge, how do they sign the pledge kind of a thing. And then finally, we have this template here, which is a template for your testimonials. You see that's kind of a picture. So a picture of the person, the person, and then we've got several quest, probing questions you can use to to, to get people to answer and then you put that on the testimonial and you, you get that out in whatever form is most um, efficient at the work site that you're dealing with to let people know, hey, uh, my colleague over here went out and got her, her colorectal cancer screening. This was her experience. It wasn't so bad. I ought to do it myself kind of thing. So we have a template for that. And then this uh, document here is actually a, if you're going to use social media, and that will be appropriate in certain, with certain companies, and it, it won't necessarily be very effective in others, so you should consider the company that you're dealing with. But um, these are specific messages that can be given out in tweets, on Facebook, or in emails. And these messages actually uh, come from the American Cancer Society, a study they did on messages that were effective to remove barriers from our target population, which is people who are employed who also have insurance. And so they did a study of what are the main barriers for that and what are messages that resonate with this group of people. And so we've created kind of a, a sheet you can use to set up a, a Twitter or Facebook messages over a period of time that you can use for social media. So that's the campaign, the communication campaign. Get that message out there. Let Have employees seeing these things multiple times in multiple forms. And what are the real, the key messages? So you can see from our little logo here, the key messages are that colorectal cancer is preventable. It's treatable. It's beatable. This is a simple message. I actually started out uh, with the National Colorectal Cancer Roundtable, had a big campaign, 80% by 2018, and this is their key messages. And they are, uh, one, accurate and true, and really relevant. So getting people to have the idea, hey, I don't have colorectal cancer is something I can prevent. And if I just get screened, I don't have to suffer from colorectal cancer is a really important message. And these are simple messages you can get out in multiple ways as well. So what about the two information sessions? So the, the two information sessions basically in the first information session, and we have PowerPoints that you can use for these information sessions. In the first information session, um, we are getting a health professional to come in and talk about what is colorectal cancer. You know, literally, what is it? Walk through the colon, what happens? How does colorectal cancer develop? 
two, what are the screening guidelines and what kinds of screenings are out there and available to you? And three, a little bit about prevention. In addition, in session, information session one, you get the human resource person or the benefits person from the company to come and tell people what their insurance covers in terms of colorectal cancer screening. So specifically, what screenings are covered? Are there any co-pays? What happens if you have to move on to a diagnostic? So you get that individual to come in and tell the employees what their coverage is. In addition, um, hopefully that person will help you get a list of who are the providers within our network that you can go to to actually get your colorectal screening. So this session is really important. It's, an, it's a session that hopefully will bust some myths about um, colorectal cancer and also about the screenings and will give people options in terms of screening. And it also then um, tells them what their insurance covers and where they can go to get the screening. So it's a really important information session for employees. The second information session is about how do we prevent, what lifestyles prevent colorectal cancer. So the real evidence behind diet, physical activity, and weight ma man management uh, and, it's, um, and how it can help it prevent colorectal cancer. And so um, in this session, uh, if possible, we encourage you to look for a nutrition specialist and or a physical activity specialist to give this presentation and um, also to, to do some hands-on something. So um, because the sessions are designed to only be an hour, uh, I think you could either do a food demonstration or you could actually do a physical activity demonstration, whichever one works with your work site. Um, but I know that ex as extension agents, we're great at doing food demonstrations. And so there are some wonderful recipes that go along with the recommendations for higher fiber, increased fruits and vegetables, um, adding dairy to your diet, et cetera, that you can use to demonstrate in a food demonstration and tasting the people about how they can implement some of the things that are being um, recommended during this information session. I just want to say if, if you have a question for me, I'm talking pretty fast. So if you have a question, just unmute yourself and interrupt me. I don't mind at all. So let's make this pretty casual. Uh, any questions to this point? Can these be used really as a lunch and learn session for employers to use for their employees? They Absolutely. So these are like two lunch and learns. Excellent. Thank yeah. you. And that's a great time for the employer to, if he wants to do that, buy and maybe even supply the lunch or something, you know, so that's a good way for them to do that. And of course, it depends on the website, uh, on the work site. So if you've got, and we'll talk about that in a little while as well. If you've got a work site that has shifts, then it may not work out necessarily to be a, a lunch and learn. You have to repeat that session multiple times. We'll talk about that in a minute. Okay, so what is this? Go ahead. Sorry, go ahead. Rudy, do you have a question? Yes. Um, um, so basically for session one, you talked about, uh, you know, uh, addressing the uh, presentation first or session first uh, with the help of health professional, right? Can mm -hmm. you give more insights about that? Uh, are the presentations already ready? Mm -hmm. or they have to create the content um, and we are following certain template for it? No, we actually have a PowerPoint, a ready PowerPoint they can use with all okay. the information on it. Now, I know that um, physicians, uh, we've had physicians do this and this, is, this template has, has, is, a, is complete. It gives accurate information, but they always like to pull in other stuff. So they'll, they'll add to the they'll add to the PowerPoint and put in stuff that they like so um, and they sh and you should allow them to do that so as long as they're providing the information that's on the PowerPoint if they want to bring in other stuff which really makes it their own and, and it more engaging that's perfectly fine okay and the and same health insurance coverage uh, I mean I'm, I'm wondering how long the first session is because it feels like it's a content heavy information and uh, I'm not sure if it can, it can be, uh, you know, uh, taught within an hour's time. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, it actually can. So we've done this several times, and I wish, I'm wondering if Glenn's on the, we had several people uh, who actually have conducted this, but they, did, they didn't jump on the call. Um, it can be. And so you'll see um, when you look at the PowerPoint, um, mm -hmm. it does seem content heavy. Um, I did this for, for our uh, extension, and we did it in, as a webinar, 
and I had a, both a physician and a and a our representative from our health insurer, and we were able to do it in in probably forty five minutes. So yeah, but you're right. Okay. Yeah, uh, depending on questions and answers, and people tend to have. And if you wanted to, anyway, it's, it's possible. Okay. Uh, and you had mentioned for session two uh, that you know any nutrition expert uh, in the field can t teach it. Have you had uh, people from extension? Would the FCS background teach this content? Or does yes. it have to be one? Huh? Yes, I've had extension agents actually provide the content. Um, mm -hmm. When I did it, we had an RD who mm -hmm. was certified in oncology actually provide it. And then we had a, also had a physical fitness person who mm -hmm. was certified by the ACS um, for physical fitness for cancer survivors. So, uh, you know, so you can pull in and, and in, in a, so it's not necessary, but if you pull in those kinds of people, oftentimes they can, they can, they have added experience to bring to the session um, that makes it more engaging and um, for the individuals, but it certainly is not necessary. It's basic okay. nutrition information of, uh, recommendations related to decreasing colorectal cancer risk. Which is increased fiber opinion, lower. What is the best approach, uh, the online or hybrid education or in person education? Have you noticed any difference in the delivery and the uh, audience engagement? Yeah, that's a really good question. So um, I think when you offer it online, it, and it depends on the work site that you're going to pull in to, to do this. If it is, uh, so in, the, in our case, when I did it online, it's because we were doing it statewide for all extension employees. And so, of course, with those kind of webinars, particularly if you're trying to get a lot of people to join in on the webinar, you can't get that, want, that real one-on-one -on -one engagement because you've got 100 people on your call, right? So, um, but you reach a lot more people, right, through the, and you can record it, and then people can go back and listen to it, which was our experience. But if you're at a work site where you're trying to really tap into this group of people who works for this company in a single location, and you want those people to start talking with each other about it and encouraging each other, um, then the one-on-one -on -one becomes really important. Uh, so I think, I think both ways has um, benefits and um, it depends on the work site that you're at. Any way that you can make the the information session more accessible to people who may not be able to attend in person, I think, is, is important. Um, and so we haven't had anybody do, for, so for instance, if you do an in-person presentation, the only way that you can have that available to others is if you videotape it, video record it. We haven't had anybody do that. Um, so, but you, you might think outside of the box in order for that thing to be available to more people. Okay, thank you. Um, and I'd love, I'm going to love to see how you guys, what you guys do with it. So that, that's part of uh, sending it out there and then see, see how you guys implement it. Okay, so the colorectal cancer pledge, uh, we have this actual pledge. You can print up and, and cut up into little pledge, uh, pledge cards and you get people in, during the information session and at other times to actually sign the pledge. What worked best for us was when we put it online and let people just log in and sign the pledge. So if you, if you are with a work site that has that capability to set up a, like a little Qualtrics or something where people could go on, click on a button and actually sign the pledge electronically, that was very, very effective and really convenient for people um, versus physically signing the pledge. But what you want to do is get people to sign the pledge and then let others in, in the, in the worksite know, hey, look, we've got a 50 people who've signed the pledge or we have 100 people who've signed the pledge. So you want people, it's for the individual who actually takes the action to sign the pledge, but it's also to let the other employees know, hey, we've got people signing this pledge, right? Um, and what does the pledge say? The pledge says, if I'm of age and I haven't been screened, I'll go out and get screened. And it says, and I'm going to talk to some other people about this too. So that's basically what they're pledging to do. Um, so now I want to quickly just tell you the kinds of outcomes we experienced. We did it with extension and then also the outcomes of our extension agents doing it in communities, just real quick. Um, so when we did it, um, of the people who responded to our surveys and stuff, 50% uh, of them actually signed the pledge. And, when we, and it was great when we put it online, that just exploded. 65% uh, of people responding to our survey post-event said they actually talked to others about colorectal cancer and screen, 
And then they also responded to changes they'd made in their diets related because of, or, or their behaviors because of the information session. So 76% said they increased fruits and vegetables, 50% decreased meat and increased fiber, and 40% said they increased their physical activity. So I think that the program is, is, in, is, is effective at getting people to actually think about changing and changing the behaviors. In addition, we did a quick study on self-efficacy uh, pre and post our event, and we found a significant increase in people's self-efficacy that they could go out and do something about colorectal cancer. And the other interesting thing that we found was that self-efficacy, the perceived benefits of getting screened, and a reduction in barriers, those changes, like increase in self-efficacy and perceived benefits and decrease in barriers, was relevant to the number of engagements the individual had with the different things we had going on with the program. So if they'd signed the pledge, if they'd gone to an information session, if they'd seen something online, as that number increased, uh, these, the changes actually increased. So it's important that you have multiple things happening. For us, we had saw a 20% increase in screening rate in a year uh, after the program. So um, now that was, we, we did that a little bit more intensively. So, after we did that, then some of our extension agents, four of our, five of our extension agents went out and conducted, four of our extension agents conducted this program in five counties. And so, uh, and that, so it was in work sites, just local work sites, a uh, little bit of a smaller program over four weeks. And we found with that kind of pilot study of those programs, an increase in knowledge of colorectal cancer and screening guidelines, 20% increase in knowledge of the, what are the recommendations for screening, between 7 and 14% increase in knowledge of lifestyle factors, depending on what the lifestyle factor was that impacts colorectal cancer screening. But we had 90% of respondents agreed that they were planning on taking action. Taking, they're going to talk to their health care provider, they're going to get screened, they're going to eat healthier, they're going to increase their physical activity. So their intentions to actually change things, it was very impressive. Now, in that study, we didn't measure what they actually did. In, our, in this current program, I'm hoping we can get those measures. What did the administrators say about the program? So their general impressions, they think it was, at least the way we implemented it, our agents did, well organized, the information was thorough and accurate, it met their expectations, um, and it was informative and held participants' interest. They also thought that it benefited their employees and fit into what, what they want to do with their employees in terms of increasing their health. So now, specifics about the program. I'm going to stop real quick. Do we have any questions? Let's see what my time is. Okay, we got time. Did you actually, this is Jacqueline, did uh -huh. you actually identify which businesses within a specific zip code in their benefits covered uh, the coverage in this area before you decided which businesses to work with first? No, but we did, but the businesses that we did target did provide health insurance for their employees. Now, the Affordable Care Act has required um, that, that colorectal cancer screening with no copay, actually. Okay, so, and the next question, did you work with your area hospitals that, because many times larger corporations have a partnership with a specific hospital if you're in an environment that has more than one hospital in a, in a community? So in terms of... Um, like providing primary care would be one hospital for their employees? Yeah. So we, we actually conducted the program within a hospital system, uh, okay. that, and that was challenging because you had shifts. So... We did do it within a hospital system, and actually the recommendations from administrators were that that was not a real good environment to conduct the program because you had the shifts, the shifts of people, and they couldn't get away from their work to actually attend the session. So um, that environment didn't seem the most, amazingly, in a healthcare environment, was not the most conducive for, to target employees to get them to do colorectal. That was that one hospital system's experience. Uh, but I know that it's been conducted not by us, but in other uh, locations in a hospital system where it was more successful. So I don't think you should necessarily eliminate the clinics and hospital systems as a, as a venue for program. Thank you. There are some challenges. Yeah. So, and this is perfect. Thank you for the segue because we're going to talk about identifying potential partners. So we have a, um, a little 
worksheet here just to get you to think about who, who, what kind of work sites can I implement this program in, what's in my area, and so we encourage you to do an assessment of the companies that exist in your area and think about things like the number of employees they have, um, what are the employees' occupations, what are they doing within the business, um, do they have health insurance, um, et cetera. And this, if you use the worksheet, it will help you think that through a little bit and also get, your, get contact information for each one of the locations you're thinking about. But basically, um, uh, if you look for businesses that you know, have a relatively, not, not a huge number of employees, that can be kind of challenging, but maybe for your first one, employee, maybe 50, 100 employees, something around there, so you've got a, a larger number of employees, this size of, a, of an employer will also more likely provide health insurance coverage for their employees. And so we do, this program really does target people who have coverage. It's telling them to go out and get screened. So um, if you target a, a people who don't have coverage, then you need to solve this, how are they going to get coverage problem. But in this case, this program is for uh, really targeting people who have access to coverage. You should work with businesses that have employees within the screening range because we're telling them to go get screened. So biggest bag for your buck. And in general, most um, employers will be employing between 45 and 75 year olds. Um, not all though. So think about that when you're looking at the businesses you might target. And then it's always nice if the company you're going to work with has a supportive human resources department. So if they already have a department who's concerned about employee wellness um, and maybe already um, providing information to their employees about uh, local resources for primary care physicians or is linked in somehow, that will help you. But it's not indispensable, but it will certainly help you have an effective program. So that's step one, right? Who, what are the businesses in your community? And, and thinking about the ones that are, would be most beneficial for you to target. Once you've gone through this process and maybe contacted some of these businesses and some are interested, then um, you should set up an in-person meeting with management within the organization. Now, that might not be top management, but at some management level, you want to set up and have a, a sit-down meeting with, with those individuals to talk, tell them about the program. We have a program overview for work sites. So it's a document you can print up that goes over what is this program, what are the goals of the program, what happens during the program, and it also talks about um, uh, how is the program evaluated? You know, what are we going to do for evaluation of the program? Uh, and then also talks about the responsibilities of the extension agent to implement the program, but also the responsibilities of the work site to implement the program. So it's a nice, not too long. We tried to shorten it and make it as brief as possible, but as informative as possible as well. So after this sit-down meeting, what you want to walk away with is that one, Yes or no, we want to conduct this program. And if the answer is yes, you want to have management support and buy-in. Because we mentioned that administrative support is so important. Second, you'd like them to identify key contacts within the organization that you're now going to work with to get the program set up and going. And that key contact person is really important because that's who you're going to be dealing with. It'd be really nice if, they, if they're a wellness person or someone from the human resources who does this all the time who can really uh, get you in and help you get the program set up in a, in a way that can engage most employees. And then... You also want to walk away with a mutual understanding of each person's responsibilities in the program. And we have a little checklist, a little box within this program overview for work sites that goes through what is the responsibilities of the extension agent, the management, and then the on-site coordinator. So it helps define that, and that'll put you on a kind of a solid foundation when you start doing the program. So once you've done that, and you've got the administration buy-in, you've told them exactly what's going to happen, and then you've got your contact person, then you need to start setting your stuff up. You should um, call, you should set up either a phone conversation with that contact person to begin going through some of the specifics. So in our toolkit, when you go onto the site, we have the materials, it, it has all this information for you. But basically, you should do some initial planning. The one, think about logistics, so what's going on in this work site, when do employees get to work, uh, is it shift work or do they all go off to lunch at the same time, or what's the best location within this work site to actually conduct our information sessions, um, thinking about um, 
communication. How does the business communicate with their employees and how can you use that system to begin transmitting those, those really important messages that you want to transmit, right? Announcing the program is going to happen, um, letting people know when the information sessions are and where they are, um, encouraging people to be engaged in signing the pledge, um, getting people to be to send in their testimonials, so that all that communication we talked about initially, you want to think about how the, that can best be done within this worksite. And that person you're going to be working with from the worksite is going to be really important to guiding you in that. So um, just so initially, what are the logistics? How are we going to be communicating? Where are we going to be holding these information sessions and when? And then also talk about incentives. Does the, employee want, does the employer want to offer any incentives for people who are participating in the program? And what would those incentives look like? And I've mentioned se several ideas here. Um, session, in, session incentives for attendance. So if people come to the information session, are they going to get a little something? Um, how about uh, incentives for those who sign the pledge? Would there be an incentive if you actually sign the pledge? Some employers could do things like um, paid, I don't know, paid time off to go get your colorectal cancer screening, um, th things that the employer can offer that doesn't necessarily cost them anything, but that is a benefit to the employee. That's a possibility as well. You can see here on this, I have your three-month follow-up participation. When I talk about the evaluation plan, uh, this will come clear, but what we'd like to do with this program, in order to get real information about whether people actually take action based on the program, um, we're asking people to give permission to call them back in three months and just ask them, did you go and get screened? Why or why not? Did you change any of your lifestyles? Why or why not? As simple as that. And so potentially the employer would want to offer um, uh, some kind of an incentive for employees who would actually respond at three months that information, I think, is valuable to the employer as well, particularly if they're, if they're really bought into the program. Okay, so, we're, so that's program planning. That's step three. That's just the initial planning. So once you've gotten those questions answered with the worksite, then you're going to plan your individual sessions. And so for instance, for session one planning, I mentioned that you really want to get a healthcare provider to um, give, this, uh, give this talk. If you can get an enterologist or an oncologist or a GI doc, um, a gastroenterologist, that would be great. Um, we did actually on our webinar, we were able to do that because we were doing it virtually. It made it pretty easy. And uh, I'm not, I think one other, maybe at the, the healthcare system, they were able to get a physician. But uh, a nurse, a nurse practitioner who's worked in oncology or who has worked for an uh, oncologist is another good option. Uh, for somebody who can provide this kind of a presentation. Um, but it should be somebody who kind of has authority to speak on this so people, you know, believe them, basically. Um, so uh, that can be some of the most challenging things is to get this person to come in and give this presentation. That may be where your human resource person really comes in handy because if they're already doing wellness programs, they may already be working with healthcare professionals who provide this kind of information. If not, um, don't be shy about seeking out people from physicians' offices at, at hospitals and clinics in your area to provide the information, and oftentimes they're very willing to do that. And then you need to set up with the human resource person that they need to be there as well to provide information to their employees about, excuse me, about... Um, their insurance coverage. And then uh, we give you a list of what you ought to print off for the session. And I mentioned here, um, there is some very, really nice ACS, American Cancer Society, brochures about colorectal cancer. And you can get those. Um, we have uh, kind of a printable copy in, on Canvas, but you can also get them from your American Cancer Society representative. They're very willing to provide you access to these brochures for your programs. For session two, very similar. Um, decide who's going to give the presentation. If you can get a registered dietitian who's certified in oncology, that'd be great. If not, just a registered dietitian. If not that, I think that many extension agents uh, who are versed in nutrition can provide this presentation. 
similarly with f physical activity, you have a physical therapist who actually works with cancer survivors or is AS, ACSM certified. Um, they would be great author kind of authoritative figures to give a presentation about physical activity, but not 100% necessary. In terms of uh, if you're going to do a food de demo, decide whether you're going to do a food demo. I think it's a great idea. It gives people the chance to actually taste or telling them. Um, look through the presentation rather than script what kind of recipe you ought to do. Uh, we haven't done that. Um, there are wonderful resources for getting colorectal cancer um, risk reduction recipes uh, right online. One really great resource is the American Institute for Cancer Research. They have a whole recipe section, lots of recipes that incorporate fruits and vegetables, are non-meat alternatives, high fiber, et cetera, that go along with the recommendations. But do what you're comfortable with in terms of selecting a recipe. If you're and again, I have a, some other recommendations for flyers you can bring to the presentation that reinforce what people are being told. Choices for Good Health by American Cancer Society is one of those. And again, you'll notice you're printing off the pledge cards. So at the meeting, people are having the opportunity to actually sign the pledge card. Um, and then also the surveys, which I'll talk about in a minute. Any questions about program planning for sessions one at the information sessions one and two? Everybody still with me? I haven't lost anybody. Okay. Marnie Deco. Okay. So now evaluation. So we've tried to um, simplify as much as we possibly could how to evaluate the outcomes of this program. <laughs> uh, but um, and so basically, what what we've come down to. First of all, I should tell you that I submitted this program to the Western IRB uh, for. Uh, for oversight of human subjects protection training, uh, human subjects uh, protection. WERB uh, came back with a determination that this project was exempt from IRB oversight. They didn't consider it research because it really is program development and, and minimal risk. And so I have WERB um, exemption for this study Having said that, for those of you who um, uh, have your own IRBs, you need to confirm with your own IRB if you're going to be doing uh, these um, surveys and then using those surveys for um, reporting purposes, et cetera. You still need to confirm with your IRB that they will defer to the WERB decision or if they need uh, to review the, the project themselves. So when we're talking about evaluations and then reporting these outcomes, I think that's where the research side of things comes in. Um, I'm, I absolutely will work with you to help you accomplish that. I've already submitted it to my own IRB and to the WERB, and I have all that documentation for you. So we can work together for that if you have an IRB that provides oversight of your work and they require uh, a review to review this themselves, I'm happy to work with you on that. If, if they'll defer to WERB, that's even better. But so now, outcome evaluation. Basically, we have a pre and post survey for each information session. And hopefully, I'll be able to pull up a copy of that and you'll get to see it. But uh, the first thing on the pre survey is uh, just a question. Um, because, because WERB has determined this is exempt, we don't need uh, informed consent. However, uh, on the survey, the first section asks them if they give us permission to call them in three months to follow up to see if they've taken action. The individual says yes or no, uh, and if they say yes, they provide the contact information they want us to use to, to do that contact, and then they sign that. So that's the first thing that happens on the survey. And then the survey, I recommend that you print off the um, pre and post survey together. In fact, that's how you'll find them in the, in the campsite. Um, and the first part of the survey is some simple knowledge questions, and then there's a big stop. People stop. So you have, hand them this packet. They answer whether or not they'll allow you to follow up with a phone call. They 
uh, answer the first one page uh, knowledge question and then there's a big stop and they stop there and they listen to the, the program and then you ask them, okay, now go on and answer the second, uh, the post survey. So they just turn the page over and then they answer who, uh, the post survey and now you've got your pre and post survey. I think that's the easiest way to do the pre and post survey. Um, and then for the three month follow up phone interview, uh, if you choose to do that portion of it, I realize it's a, it is a little bit of an effort to go back and then contact these people, but um, I think it's really worth it. It's the most valuable piece of information we could actually get from the program is if anybody took action. Um, then you just call the people up and, and record their responses, uh, and then you've got that data. In addition to these pre and post for the two information sessions and then the follow-up, um, I'd like, I personally would like to do a process evaluation of how you all implement the program. So I designed a couple of checklists for the first session, information session, and for the last information session, just so I can uh, see how you guys implemented your sessions. And then also I'd like to do a post-program interview. So when you've done, finished your sessions, I'd like to call you up and just talk to you about what you did, uh, if you're willing to allow me to do that. So that is the program evaluation for this program. Any questions about the evaluation? Any um, worries about the evaluation? Okay. So then steps five and six really are just to actually get, hard, get down to actually doing, doing the planning for sessions one and sessions two. And we provide you this checklist, which hopefully makes it easy. You know, you have to do this and do this and do this, and you check all those things off, and then you should be ready, ready to go. And that's in our on the site. Okay. So now what I'd like to do is show you the site we've created uh, for you to get on and access all these materials and all the information I just talked about. So is everybody ready for me to do that? Does anybody have a question before I move forward? Okay, so what I'm going to have to do is I'm going to have to stop sharing just for a second so that I can um, share my internet with you. So hold on just a minute. You're going to lose me when I stop sharing. And then let me see if I can share. I think I'm going to just share my screen with you. You'll see everything on my screen. Excuse me if there's something weird on my screen. Let's see. And then I will open up. Okay. So could somebody just tell me, are you seeing my... Um, you should be seeing my screen and it says color to cancer free zone on the top. Yes, Are you guys, yeah. You're seeing yeah. it? Okay, good. Yeah. So this is our, uh, our site. And this is the view that you will see when you log into the site. And we've tried to make it as easy as possible to navigate. We've even tested it with some agents to, to see, you know, the recommendations they might have. But basically you come onto the home page and you're going to see these steps program steps, okay? And each one of these is a link to another step and the materials that you need for each one of those steps. You'll also see um, that we have program communication resources. So all of those resources I showed you, the proclamation letter, the flyers, um, the social media uh, messages, all of that can be found here under program communication resources. So if you just want to access those, you can directly here. And then program evaluation tools. If you want to just go to the program evaluation tools, you can also go directly here and get the evaluation tools. Um, another way to navigate through all of these kind of sequentially is to just click on the first one so this will take you to the program overview. If you want to read about the program, the background and the history, uh, it's here. You go down, it talks about the structure, everything we've said. But when you get to the bottom, you'll see you can just hit next. And that will allow you to scroll page by page through those links that you found on the home page. So now if we click next, now we're on step one. And basically, this is just the information we've talked about on our conversation here talks about how to evaluate potential um, partners, um, et cetera. 
and then how do you contact businesses and then when you get here you hit next and this will take you to some of the resources that are available to you for doing step one so for instance it tells you this is a checklist but this is also a link now to the local business assessment worksheet so if you wanted to go directly to that local business assessment worksheet uh, you would click on it and it's going to open up as its own document for you to use okay so here is this local assessment worksheet that we talked about and now you can print it or you can use it electronically you can save it on your computer whatever you want to do with it but now you have access to that local uh, assessment document okay and so uh, and then again of course just if you want to keep moving forward to other resources you can do that here's another way to access that worksheet um, and just keeping clicking next you'll just continue to scroll through um, and then finally this is the kind of a checklist for this step one that you can print off if you want to print off the checklist and now we're on to step two if you ever want to get back to the home page so step two gives you the same information you can keep scrolling through but if you want to go back to the home page you just come here and hit home and then that will take you back to that initial home page okay where then you can access any one of these steps without scrolling through each one are there any questions so far okay so then um, each one of these steps is kind of the same thing when you go into the step um, you'll be able to scroll through it will give you first a description of what you should be doing in the step then it'll give you kind of a checklist you get the checklist of what you should be doing in each step in some instances there is a link so this is the program overview packet for work sites I talked to you about that you can print off and give to um, the um, the work site and it always opens up as a separate document that you can download and print okay so here is the example of this uh, colorectal cancer program works work site that you would print off and give to uh, the employers right here are the um, within this document we describe for them how we're evaluating the program in each session and then we also here's this I mentioned this table that tells what are extensions responsibilities in the program what's management's responsibilities and what's the program coordinators responsibilities clearly defined so that they know exactly what they're getting into and here's a place where you all would identify contact people for your program okay so in each one of these steps you're going to find those resources and also go back to the home page by just clicking this little button at the bottom which takes you back to the home page any questions all right I would like to uh, know more about uh, the data collection once we collect the data would you would you want the, that data to be shared with you mm -hmm. how that process works and uh, I mean you talked about IRB uh, if we are interested to implement this program in other states which I'm one of those states uh, can it be part of your existing IRB or is it is it better to just have a separate IRB for it mm -hmm. so let's go to the ev program evaluation tools and I'll show you here what I've set up for this so here are the evaluation tools okay this is the mm -hmm. pre post survey for the both sessions this is the follow-up survey and then here are those checklists I told you about each of these are links when you click on them it opens up as a separate document okay I'll show you that in a minute here's the information about um, the word determination and I've attached the word determination letter there uh, if most certainly if your IRB so uh, depending on where you're in if you're at a university then you have an IRB you have an institutional review board in your you should in your uh, university that oversees research you should communicate with your IRB and ask them what their process is for this so you should tell them that this is a study being conducted at multiple sites that WERB has actually determined 
the, that the, the main site has submitted an application to WERB and WERB has determined that this is exempt, what is their process? So we also have an IRB at Virginia Tech. Virginia mm -hmm. Tech defers their decision to WERB. And so I initially submitted to my, my Virginia Tech IRB. They told me I could go to WERB. I went to WERB and got the exemption letter and Virginia Tech has deferred to WERB's decision. And so if your institution will defer to WERB, then it's just a process of providing them this determination letter and then they'll defer. Some uh, IRBs will say, no, we need to review the, we need to review the, pro the program um, ourselves, in which case I can provide you all the, uh, the research protocol. I can provide you everything that I submitted to my IRB and WERB, which should help you submit your own IRB. Um, and then you should get, um, you should get IRB approval if they require that. That is if you want to evaluate the program and report it as human research, right? So, mm -hmm. um, which I'm hoping everybody will because otherwise we won't know how good this program is unless we actually evaluate it. If you okay. say, look, I just want to do the program and I'm not going to do any evaluations. I just want to do the program. That's fine with me. It's, it's not ideal, but absolutely I'll give you access to the program and you can implement the program uh, and you'll, I'll give you access to this site as well. So, okay, uh, let's say uh, from my end, I do the IRB process and I have an approval. Uh, I'll collect the data and I'm very sure that you would want to know the data. You would like to have access to that data. Yeah. How that process will work. So this is what you do. You're going to print up, you're going to, um, oh, you're going to, um, let me show you this so you guys can see what the so first survey work. The first survey is the longest one. Okay. Um, so I told you that, um, you all can see this document? Mm -hmm. Okay, yeah. good. So here's this first survey, and here's what I told you about this first contact information. It says we'd like to contact you. If you give permission, provide your name, address, whatever you'd like us to contact you. So if they provide their information here, they're giving us permission to contact them. And then, let me see if I can... And we ask just a little bit of, about, you know, how old they are. That's really important because we want to know whether they're screening age, right? And if they've been screened and how. And then we ask some simple questions. These are just knowledge questions about um, colorectal cancer, right? And then there's that big stop. Then they should stop there and you should tell them that. So when you hand them the packet, you're going to say you're going to have, you could do it either way. So I think the easiest is just to give them both of them. But if you want to give out the pre first and the post later, you can do that that way. But anyway, this is stop. You have them stop. Then they listen to what the, the session and then they come back and they answer the post program which are the same knowledge questions, right? And mm -hmm. then this is, this is, um, these are questions that we used in our program to evaluate changes in self-efficacy and barriers, and we shortened them up a little bit, but it's a post-pre kind of a question. So you say, I want you to think about how you feel now about this question, circle the appropriate answer, and then I want you to think about how you felt before the session and circle the answer. And so this is a kind of an interesting post pre if you, uh, hopefully you all are familiar with that, but it's mm -hmm. gonna give us the better idea of how they feel that the information has actually changed their attitudes, which is the interesting piece of information. And this is uh, relatively, this one question is kind of looks a little bit long. We'll see how it goes. And then that's it uh, mm -hmm. for that. And then these two questions, right? You're likely to take an action. So this is the people survey for the first one, and then demographics, which they can answer or not, you know, if they want to. Okay. Now, once you you would collect these, um, remember since you should staple them together, that's another good reason for stapling them together because you want to have the same person who answered the pre. You want to know that they also answered the post, right? Um, mm -hmm. And then I have here a place for you to attach those scanned evaluations right here in this, in this, um, on the Canvas site, okay? So um, when you click here, all you do is hit submit, 
and scan, scan your pre-post surveys, hit submit and attach it as a document and then I've got them. Okay. Do you encourage uh, online surveys if employees are able to do online surveys? So um, my intention, let me see if I can go home. Oop, sorry. My intention, and you'll notice here under evaluation, program evaluation. Um, when you get here, you have this link to evaluation data entry database. Um, I'm going to create a Qualtrics survey where you can input the actual, the, the data from the questions right into a Qualtrics survey. Um, I have a feeling that most people aren't going to want to do that. It's a little labor intensive. That's why I have, what I have active right now is just that you scan those and attach them and then I'll enter them into a database. But this will eventually be live and, and you could potentially use that Qualtrics database to have people answer those questions online, the one that I develop. Uh, I would just give you access to um, the link, and have that, send that link to your participants. You could also develop your own. So if you've got another database that you'd like to use as a, a kind of a survey database where people could just click onto the link and then answer those questions, um, you could also do that. Uh, I'm fine with that. Um, what we'd have to do is figure out how we're going to join our data together so that we can have um, outcomes from the entire program. Is that clear? I think uh, we can always have, share and access. Uh, I, uh, we use, in our system, we use uh, Qualtrics. So uh -huh. maybe we can give you access to, uh, have an access to the data and make you like a, maybe a, a co-contributor of the project uh, so that you can access the data. Uh, I'm mostly asked, I'm interested in that is because I'm thinking about also trying out not just in person but online too because when it comes to worksite wellness, it is becoming more and more common for people uh, to do more online kind of uh, professional development or, uh, you know, education. Mm -hmm. So that's why I would like to try, both, you know, have two separate cohorts and see what was best uh, approach. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, when, I, when we did the statewide um, program, um, we just had links, so people would be on the information session, and then right there in the Zoom meeting, we had the link for them to go onto the link and answer the answer the surveys. Very convenient, and you get a higher, we get a very nice response rate uh, from that as well. And then you, after the session, you can also send out the link and have them answer the the pre and post surveys also on the link. That's a great idea. And then we use Qualtrics, so if we're both we're, if we're both using Qualtrics. That would work. Okay. I do have one more question. I'm sorry. <laughs> no, that's um, good. So my question is that when it comes to incentive, uh, you know, in our university system, what, what, do, what were some of the uh, incentives you have given or you can recommend to, to me? Yeah, so we did, I did buy, and they're relatively inexpensive, the little blue wristbands and the little stars for people who actually came to the sessions, they all got, um, got those. And then for my um, follow-up survey, I had gift card, little, little, um, I think it was $10, $15 gift cards uh, for people to do follow-up surveys. So those are the incentives that I've used. Other programs, um, when you're talking about work sites, though, they may have access to incentives that really aren't monetary, like paid time off or paid leave uh, that goes beyond their vacation time kind of a thing um, that they might be able to offer and recommend to incentivize their employees. Okay, any, any questions? I'd like y'all just to kind of uh, give me some feedback. Is this clear? Uh, did you, do you understand the process? Just want to make sure I'm not leaving anybody confused. Jacqueline? Yes, it was very good and very helpful and uh, very usable, I believe, with our um, groups that are wanting polling cancer education. Okay, great. So what I'd like to do, uh, what I need to do for you guys to have access to this, I'd like you to send me an email and say, yes, I, this is something I'd like to do, I'd like to implement, please provide me access to the Canvas site, and then I'm going to um, enter you in as, if you're not from Virginia Tech, you'll be a guest, and you should receive an email from Canvas site saying you've been invited, and you should accept that, and you'll have access to the, the Canvas site materials. Uh, if you're from Virginia Tech, I just add you. 
Um, what I would like, uh, if you could, just um, keep me informed about what you're doing. So when you schedule a program, uh, if you'll just let me know, I've scheduled a program here, are the dates I'm going to be doing it so I can be thinking about you um, and then looking for those evaluations that would be coming in. I'm, I will share this, uh, the, our outcomes and our data with all of you. And as a matter of fact, if, if we publish or we, we find that we get great results and we'd like to be publishing or presenting this information, I'm more than happy for all of you to be uh, co-authors and contributors to whatever comes out of uh, implementing this program. So um, share the wealth. Whatever we do together, uh, we'll also share the outcomes together as well. Do you, do you have a timeline that you want, would like us to launch this in our sites outside of Virginia or outside of the network? And you know, the timeline that you're working with so we can put that on our um, calendar. Yeah, so, I, you know, this really isn't a, this, it, I don't really have a timeline. Uh, if we could, I think, though, if you delay too much, you know, then the likelihood of actually doing it might, uh, mm -hmm. might, uh, get smaller. So I would say within the next six months. Um, unfortunately, I'm getting this out to you a little late. March is colorectal cancer month, which is a great month to do a program like this, or at least start a program like this in, during colorectal cancer month, because you've got all the other resources of the NCCRT and ACS is all promoting um, colorectal cancer in the month of March. So it's a, it's a good month if you've got kind of a company you work with and who might be ready to go to, to get the program up and going. Um, but if not, I think any, any, any months, but let's say uh, within six months, if you're going to implement the program, go ahead and get it implemented and we can start collecting data. And then feel free to contact me for any question, anything you need. If you're going to submit it to your IRB, I'm really happy to help you get that done um, with all the information I've already put together for my own IRB submission. Okay, with that, I've gone seven minutes over. Thank you all. I'm so glad we fi I finally got this off the ground and that you've joined in on the call. I look forward to seeing how you use the program. I think that's the most exciting thing. Okay, thank you so much. You're Thanks. welcome. Thank you so much. Okay, bye-bye. Bye. -bye. Bye.